and then uh, yeah elder larry will lead us in in prayer now the problem is i can't see where is my <laughs> We'll sing a cappella. A cappella na lang. A cappella. I can put the CD. Okay. Don't forget. Where's the don't forget? 388. 388. Do you want me to put the... Yeah, you can put it there. 388. Get inside. Get inside. Get Let's all stand. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
that you have guided us you gave us the strength to overcome all the circumstances that surround us Lord and uh, today Lord as we worship you please give us the mercy that we need and the blessings that we want to share and uh, we want to to live our life in accordance with your will Lord and please give mercy to Pastor uh, Pastor Leomar as he, he give his message today Lord may you give him the wisdom that uh, you want to impart to us Lord and thank you for this wonderful day of Sabbath and please forgive our sin in Jesus name we pray Amen, Amen. Good evening everyone, happy Sabbath and happy Canada Day. <clears throat> I do believe that it is already summer, <laughs> even though summer begins at July or June 21, but during uh, that past weeks we have had some rains and uh, I think right now is for me the official summer. <laughs> so good evening everyone, uh, <clears throat> tonight I'll be dealing with the book of Colossians, this is the <clears throat> continuation of our, uh, let's say, survey in the New Testament. I remember when we were in seminary, we have a <clears throat> subject called Old Testament Survey. So right now we are dealing with the New Testament and we are in the book of Colossians. In our stand, in our commentary, we adopted that the book of Colossians were written during the time of uh, Apostle Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Some say in Ephesus, but uh, we just adopt uh, Rome during it was written 
during the 60s AD. And there are things that we need to consider when we read the book of Colossians because Apostle Paul presented the <clears throat> centrality of Christ's message of forgiveness and salvation. And in the same way, uh, the purpose is also to show that Christ is preeminent. And it means he is the first and uh, foremost in everything. And uh, the Christian's life should reflect that priority, that he is uh, first in everything in our life. So because of this, uh, some false teachers try to persuade the believers in Colossae by uh, philosophy and tactics, okay? And try to judge them and tell them that they need to do some things and to worship angels and to practice separation from other things and some regulations in order for them to be complete as a Christian. Now, when you go to the book of Colossians, you will read this uh, statement. I'll be reading from uh, New King James Version, Colossians 1 verse 10 or verse 9. For this reason, uh, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the gospel, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So, he was simply saying, well, you are now part of Christ's body, okay, part of Christ's church or God's people. You as Gentile, you need to walk worthy of the Lord. In our previous uh, study, worthy of the gospel. Now, because of this, uh, Paul presented Jesus Christ that he is the foremost in everything. When you look at chapter 1, uh, verse, let's say, 13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his, of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. This is based on King James. 15, who is the image of the invisible God? Now, who is the image of the invisible God? Jesus Christ. Now, if you are familiar with your Bible, in Genesis, we were created in the image of God. And Jesus Christ said, John 1, 18, John 6, 46, and also in 1 John, no one has seen God. Why? Because he is invincible, God. But through Jesus Christ, because he is the image of the invisible God, Jesus Christ said, uh, <clears throat> if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Okay? Because he is the express image of his person. Now look at the words here. The firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that, that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And this is the classic statement of Paul about Christ, the, the preeminent of Christ. 
the foremost, okay? He was trying to say that if you belong to him, you are complete in him. Now, in order for Jesus Christ to create all things, he must be before all things. That's why he said all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things. Look at the 18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Look at the statement of firstborn. First in verse 15, the uh, firstborn of every creature, and then 18, the firstborn from the dead. Because it has different meaning, not the meaning of being first in chronology, but be, but he is the beginning, the source. Okay? Like for example, in 18, the firstborn from the dead. How can you born from the dead? Okay? <laughs> or first fruit. There you go. He might, in all things, that in all things, he might have the preeminence or first place. He is the first cause. Uh, that's why he created all things, or by him were created all things, and he is before all things, because he is the first cause, the first place, the eminence of Christ. Now, he said this because uh, when you look at verse 20 or 19, it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, to him to reconcile all things to himself. So before these uh, Gentiles, they were enemies before, verse 21, okay? And then 22 and 23, there is a big word, if. In the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and uh, unreprovable in his sight, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So chapter 2, look at the key word here, chapter 2, verse 4, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words or uh, deceive you with persuasive words. Verse 8, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwells all, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now let me check other translation for that verse. Colossians 2 and verse 9. I'll be reading from English Standard Version. 2 verse 9. It says there, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Uh, in other translation, in bodily form. Okay? So you are complete in him. And then also, Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you. Verse 18, let no man deceive you or trick you. Okay? This statement, let no man, verse 4, let no man, lest any man, verse 8, also in uh, 16 and 18, will guide you or give you the idea that there were some people who tried to persuade the believers in Colossae to follow their own teachings and traditions and regulations, okay? That is why Paul tried to explain, if you are in Christ, you are complete in Him. And you will see that these people, okay, uh, 18, and 19, they do not hold to the head, okay? Let no man trick you of your reward in a voluntary humility in worshiping of angels 
intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and hands or bends, having nourished, ministered, and knit together, increases with the increase of God. And then they say, verse 21, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. So, uh, Paul said, beware of these people because they will use philosophy and what else? Uh, deceive you with persuasive words. Uh, you look at chapter 2, that is beginning from verse 4, verse 8 as well, through philosophy, vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So when they go to the believers in Colossae, they impose their understanding that they're in verse uh, 16, about food, drink, feast, new moon, or Sabbath days. Now this is the contention uh, about Colossians, and many people use this to say, we don't need to, you know, keep the Sabbath, okay? And about meat and drink, okay? Because these are shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. There you go. So they say that's why we don't follow the Sabbath because of the teaching of Paul to the believers in Colossae. That is their understanding. But what is the understanding of the Bible? That is the question. Uh, this is the thing that we need to understand and need to know. Okay? In King James, the word is myth, uh, drink, holiday or holy day, new moon or the Sabbath days. In ESV, English Standard Version, the wording in verse 16 goes like this. Food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. In New King James, I think the wording there is festival, new moon, or Sabbaths. Food, drink, right? Festivals. In New American, is feast, right? So what is the interpretation of the Bible? Because they, they arrive at Colossae and try to persuade the believers about these things, all right? So when you look at that understanding, uh, they use philosophy and worship of angels and regulations, do not taste, do not handle, do not touch, some, such thing as that in verse 21. It seems that uh, they try to impose these things on the Christians. And Paul says, these are shadows of of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ, or but the body is of Christ. And they say, that's why we don't, we do not keep the Sabbath in the New Testament. All right? Now, but if you are going to let the Bible explain itself, and look at the word there, uh, 16 in ESV, food, drink, uh, festival, new moon, or Sabbath. These are shadows. We all believe that these are shadows because these are what? Ceremonial. And many, every time I, I, I look at the presentation of each side about this, 
uh, the Protestant would say, uh, where is your basis that these are ceremonials? Yeah. I think uh, they forget their Bible. I'll give you one example. Look at your Bible in Leviticus 19. Okay? I'll give you one example there. In Leviticus 19, if you are using New King James Version, there is a topic there, ceremonial and moral laws. Right? And it is mixed laws, ceremonial and moral. And let's take a look at the moral law first. Okay, moral law, verse, well, let's start with verse 11. You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Is it moral or ceremonial? Moral. That is moral. Verse 13, you shall not cheat your neighbor, nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God, I am the Lord. Moral or ceremonial? Moral. Moral. And some people say, we do not keep the law of Moses. Now the question is, which law? Because they are, these laws are still valid today. Do you put a stone before the, the, the blind people? No. <laughs> and still Christians follow this one. Verse 15, you shall not do, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go about as a tale bearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Still moral. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. Is still moral. 18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Still moral. Now, where is the ceremonial? Okay. The ceremonial, you can uh, read something like verse 5. If you offer a sacrifice, a peace offering to the Lord, you shall offer it of your own free will. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it, and on the next day. And if any remains until the third day, it shall be burned in the fire. If it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an abomination. It shall not be accepted. Therefore, everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity, because he has profaned the hallowed offering of the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from his people. This is ceremonial. Okay? There's also verse 9 in verse 10. But sometimes it is applicable today. Right? Because of the poor in the land. Okay? And you can see some of the uh, statement here verse 22 the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering before the lord for his sin which he has committed and the sin which he has committed shall be forgiven him when you come into the land and have planted all kinds of trees for food then you shall count their fruit as uncircumcised three years it shall be as uncircumcised to you it shall not be eaten but in the fourth year, all its fruit shall be holy, a praise to the Lord. In the fifth year, you may eat its fruit, that it may yield to you its increase. I am the Lord your God. You see? Sometimes, this is also uh, applicable. You will see the wisdom why God uh, say this in, in the promised land. Okay? In, in the land of Canaan. Look at the moral, give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Verse 32, moral. 
There are so many things here that you can, you can read. Okay? So, moral and ceremonial laws. Now, how about this food, uh, drink, feast, holidays, new moon, or Sabbath? These are ceremonial. And where can we find that? Okay, let's open our Bible to the book of Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, why this is ceremonial Sabbath? When you look at 23, 37, and 39, these are the feasts of the Lord. Now, the wording in Colossians, New King James is festival. ESV, feast. King James is, what is in King James? King James is uh, holiday. Okay? Now, these are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering, a grain offering, a sacrifice, drink offering, everything on its days. Besides the Sabbaths of the Lord. Now, 39. On the 15th day, on the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. The first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest. And the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. That's why it is called uh, ceremonial laws here in Leviticus 23. Now, as you can see here, when I look at the other translations in Leviticus 23, <clears throat> you will see that uh, food, drink, Leviticus 23, verse 13, the grain offering with it shall be Two tenths of an epa of fine flour mixed with oil, food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma, and drink offering. And then in 26 27, on the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. 28 And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement before you, or you before the Lord God. And what day is that? 32, it shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. You shall afflict yourselves on the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening from evening. You shall keep your Sabbath. 36, for seven days you shall present food offering. 37, these are appointed feasts, okay? So even in first day, eighth day, seventh day, these are called Sabbaths because it has, it has something to do with offering to the Lord. That's why it is ceremonial Sabbath. Feast, food, meat, drink, you name it. Okay? These are ceremonial Sabbaths. I have prepared here uh, more than that. Let's say... First Chronicles 23. So turn your Bible with me to the book of First Chronicles 23. And you will see there the same uh, statement. First Chronicles 23, 29 to 31. I'll be reading from English Standard Version. And whenever burnt offerings were offered to the Lord on Sabbaths, new moons, and feast days, according to the number required of them regularly before the Lord. Thus they were to keep charge of the tent of meeting and the sanctuary, and to attend the sons of Aaron, their brothers, for the service of the house of the Lord. So these offerings, Sabbaths, new moon, feast days, is connected to the sanctuary. Okay? 
Now we will we'll take a look at the New Testament later. Chapter chapter 2 of 2 Chronicles. So this 2 Chronicles chapter 2 verse 4. Behold, I am about to build a house for the name of the Lord my God and dedicate it to him for the burning of incense of sweet spices before him and for the re regular arrangement of showbread and for burnt offerings morning and evening on the Sabbaths and the new moons and the appointed feasts of the Lord our God as ordained forever for Israel. Okay? Chapter 8, verse 13. Let's take a look at this text. And then we will end up in the New Testament. Then Solomon offered up burnt offerings to the Lord, beginning from verse 12, on the altar of the Lord that he had built before the vestibule, as the duty of each day required offering according to the commandment of Moses for the Sabbaths, new moons, and the three annual feasts. These are the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Boots. So it has something to do with this feast and the sanctuary. Uh, let's jump to Ezekiel. We will skip some verses here. Ezekiel 45. Forty-five, beginning from uh, verse fifteen. Forty-five, beginning from verse fifteen to seventeen, and one sheep from every flock of two hundred, from the watering places of Israel, for grain offering, burnt offering, peace offering to make atonement for them, declares the Lord God. All the people of the land shall be obliged to give this offering to the prince in Israel. It shall be the prince's duty to furnish the burnt offerings, grain offerings, drink offerings, at the feasts, and the new moons, and the Sabbaths, all the appointed feasts of the house of Israel." These are the drinks, the food, the new moons, and the Sabbaths. There's something to do with the offerings in the sanctuary. That's why it is called ceremonial. Now, what is the explanation of the Bible? We, Seventh-day Adventists, okay, uh, let us practice that uh, if the New Testament explain this, okay? Let us follow what the New Testament says, not what the scholar says. The best to explain the Bible is the Bible itself. If the apostle of Jesus Christ explain this, then follow it. If some scholars deviate from the explanation of the New Testament, don't follow them. Because just like in Colossae, <laughs> they use philosophy, okay, and persuasive words to attract these believers in Colossae, hey, you, you have to believe in us. You need to do some worship of angels and our vision and our regulations. But Paul says, as long as you are in Christ, you are complete in Him. Now, let's go to the New Testament. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 9. So, Hebrews chapter 9. Verse uh, 10. Okay. But before we, did, we read Hebrews 9, verse 10, I want you to uh, look at your Bible, if you have New King James, chapter 8, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. First covenant. 
Okay? Verse 13, in that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. So, which covenant is obsolete? The first covenant that is obsolete. And now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And Protestant will say, say the Ten Commandments, which is according to Deuteronomy 4, 12, 13. The, co the covenant, even the Ten Commandments, they would say, those are obsolete. <laughs> but when you look at the interpretation of this text, okay, we also believe that the first covenant is also obsolete. What is this first covenant? Continue reading chapter 9 because in Greek text there is no chapter. This is a continuous reading. Verse 9, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. So, it has something to do with divine service, ordinances, and the earthly sanctuary. And when you read verse 2 up to verse 9, it has something to do with the sanctuary. Table of showbread, okay, second veil, tabernacle, holiest of all, golden censer, golden pot, manna, Aaron's rod, you name it. Okay? And then beginning from verse 6, about the priest preparing all these things. Okay? And verse 10 Concerned only with what? Foods, drinks, various washing, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. That's why in Coloss Colossians, Paul says, These are shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Christ fulfilled the atonement. Christ fulfilled the priestly ministry. Okay? We have a better sanctuary in heaven, not on earth. We have a better high priest, Jesus Christ. We have a better covenant, not by bloods of goats and animals, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says, if you are in Christ, you have the redemption through his blood. You have the forgiveness of sins. You are complete in him. You don't need this sacrificial and feast and new moons and sabbaths because these are ceremonials fulfilled by Christ. And how did Christ abolish this ceremonial law? In chapter 10, okay, beginning from verse 1, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never with the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. And then he explained. Verse 5. Therefore, when he, that is Jesus Christ, came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offering, sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifices and offering, that is in verse 6, burnt offerings, and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. What is the first there? Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings, sacrifices for sin. God has no pleasure in them. But when he come, okay, in the volume of the book, to do your will, O God, he said in verse 9, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering 
of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's why we also believe that the Sabbaths, okay, first day Sabbaths, eighth day Sabbaths, seventh day Sabbaths in uh, ceremonial law, these are shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Right? If these Sabbaths were taken away, there must be a remaining Sabbath. Right? And where can we find that remaining Sabbath? I'll be reading from the book of Hebrews chapter 4. From English Standard uh, Version. This is the remaining Sabbath. Okay, chapter 4. Beginning from verse 9. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. So what is God's rest? Hebrews 4, verse 4. For he has somewhere is spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Verse 6, since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And this rest is available today. Okay? Meaning, God gave us another day, opportunity, that is today. That's why you will read in verse 7, well, let's start with verse 6 again. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of what? Disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. What is that certain day? Today. That is today. Meaning, today, this rest is available to those people who will believe. But sad to say, uh, some Christians say, no, we don't want to enter it. <laughs> they will jump to Colossians because Sabbath is a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Uh, that's right, because that is ceremonial. But, the, but according to Hebrews uh, chapter 4, there remains in King James and New King James rest. But in ESV, in other translation, so then remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever entered has entered God's rest, has also rested from his works as God did from his let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Now the question is, why in verse 6, uh, even though they received good news or gospel, failed to enter? The answer is because of disobedience. Now, where can we find that in the Old Testament? I will give you an example. In Ezekiel, turn your Bible to Ezekiel, chapter 20. Two verses here, two or four. Okay, verse 12. Let's start with verse 10. So I led them out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes, made known to them my rules, by which if a person does them, he shall live. 12. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them, that they may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes, but rejected my rules, by which if a person does them, he shall live. And my Sabbaths, they greatly profaned. Verse 20, or 16. 
because they rejected my rules and did not walk in my statutes and profane my Sabbaths, for their heart went after their idols. Verse 20, And keep my Sabbaths holy, that they may be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. But the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes and were not careful to obey my rules by which if a person does them, he shall live. They profaned my Sabbaths. Verse 24, Because they had not obeyed my rules, but had rejected my statutes and profaned my Sabbaths, and their eyes were set on their idols. That's why they did not enter God's rest because these people rejected God's laws. That's why in Hebrews, the author says, but God appoints a certain day, and that certain day is today. <laughs> today, this rest is still available for God's people. So, there is Sabbath, food, drinks, feast that points to Christ. Okay? But there is one Sabbath that still remains until today. And that is Sabbath is for the people of God. So, in our situation, let's say, for example, right, if an offshoot will come into our church, and as if they, just like in Colossians, uh, they judge us or impose the regulations. You know what? According to Ellen White, if you're not vegetarian, you cannot enter into heaven. You have to be vegetarian. Don't uh, take a bath on Sabbath. Don't shine your shoes on Sabbath. Uh, <laughs> Just like that. It's the same thing. As if, if you will follow the teaching, you will be saved totally. <laughs> the same idea in Colossae. They used philosophy, enticing words, and they said, well, we have seen vision, you have to worship angels, you have to follow these regulations, do not taste, do not touch, but these are according to the commandments of men and not according to Christ. They did not hold, uh, did not hold to the, uh, the head, which is Jesus Christ. It is the same thing. That's why Paul presented in Colossians the preeminence of Jesus Christ. He is foremost in everything. And when we look in Colossians, okay, let's go to Colossians. These are the things that are important, okay? Not those regulations, those uh, ceremonials. This is in chapter 3. You can, you can understand chapter 3 here, okay? If you then be risen with Christ, or oh, I, I discussed this in Philippians, uh, to die, what, what, what is that in Philippians? Uh, and be with Christ. If you watch the Wednesday, be with Christ. So when you die, just like Paul says, you are be with Christ uh, automatically. Where can we find that? Yes, 123. For I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. And I explained last, last Wednesday what is the use of this statement, be with Christ. One statement here in chapter 3, verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ. What do we mean by that? Risen with Christ. Christ was risen 2,000 years ago. How can you be risen with him? If he's in heaven and you are here on earth. It's more on relational. Okay. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
You can read chapter 3 up to chapter 4. Paul was trying to set up, since you are now part of the body of Christ, these are the things that you need to do, not to follow those uh, regulations. Verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication and cleanliness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. Put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, verse 8, and so on and so forth. And then he review again, wives, verse 18, husbands, verse 19, children, 20, 21, fathers, up to chapter 4, masters, servants. These are the things that you need to do as a Christian. Not to believe on those people who try to entice you with persuasive words. The centrality is Christ. Now, some people say, how about pastor, do not taste, do not touch, do not handle. You know, when I was in, in college, I, I, I'll bit, uh, my mind is philosophical side. <laughs> what do you mean do not taste? Do you practice this or not? No. Are you sure? Yes. So when your mother cooks food, what is the practice? Do they taste or not? They taste it. How about you? <laughs> you see? <laughs> what do you mean do not taste? Because according to this, after the commandments and doctrines of men, because they try to impose, that's why we also, we eat now pork. Because of this. Now, what is our answer? Who gave the law about prohibition of eating unclean animals? God or men? God. But these things, according to the Bible, after the commandments and doctrines of men. That prohibition is according to the commandments of God, not men. That's why this is called regulations in other translations. That's why when you see here, 23, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to satisfying of the flesh. Why neglecting of the body? This is some sort of ascetism. What is ascetism? Uh, in order for you to be holy, okay, you separate yourself. You will not eat, you will not touch, you will not handle all these things because you want to be holy. Like a monk. You don't mingle with outsiders. You just live inside the temple. You pray every day. You don't eat this. You don't eat that. But Paul says, no. The best thing to do is, if you're risen with Christ, you know, look for the things which are above. Mortify, kill, put off, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. These things, blah, 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 blah not those regulations and things. Because I know he's a vegetarian, but his character is like a lion. He loves to bite brothers and sisters at the church, but he is vegetarian. And he will give a lecture. If you're a vegetarian, your character will be like not an animal who are so cruel and do like this and like that. And when I look at him, oh no. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't believe that. <laughs> it is the same thing. So if you encounter these issues and they try to impose their understanding of the Bible. Just rely on what the Bible says. That is the safest way to do it. 
I, I always uh, share this statement of mine and I will share it again for the sake of those who are watching. If some people, you are Seventh-day Adventist, if some people try to impose to you some things that you need to do in order for you to be saved, do not believe him or her. Because if you believe them, it only shows that you don't have eternal life. You are not still saved. And in order for you to be saved, you have to follow their teachings. That's why every time I encounter some hard, strong-willed people and try to impose their things, I am very sure in my heart that as long as I am in Christ and I am part of his body, I am saved and I am complete in him. No matter what you say, I am saved and complete in him. That's the point of Paul in Colossians, in Epistle to Colossians. So, some people say, uh, you know what, in the Philippines, we have a big group there. Uh, I encountered this. Uh, Jesus Christ is a man, and he is not God. You know my response? Your first statement is right, but the second is not. <laughs> you read our 28 fundamental beliefs, and you will see we believe that Jesus Christ is also a man because he decided to become one of us. There's a purpose. But when you say he is not God, now, I will ask you, give me the teachings from the Old and New Testament that Jesus Christ, the Son, is not God. That's the thing that you need to prove. If not, then that is only your speculation. And we do not believe in speculations. We do believe in the words of God. So don't be tricked because, you know, they also read the Bible. First Timothy 2, 5, there is one God, one God. If Jesus Christ is God, there will be two gods. And then the Holy Spirit, there will be three gods. And the Bible says, they will read the Bible. Let's read from First Timothy. So I will read to you First Timothy. This is the, their, their logic, okay? First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. If, God, if Jesus Christ is God, then the Bible should say, There are two gods and one mediator between God and man, the God Jesus Christ. You know my answer? What is the context? The context is mediation. Okay, according to your reading, verse 6 is also ransom. Hebrews 2 explained that very well. In order for him to become a high priest, he partook of the same flesh and blood. That's why when the reading is about mediation and ransom, he's a man. There's a presentation of the Bible. Some author present him when, he, when the author of the Bible tried to present him as creator, he is God. Now, well, if Jesus Christ is God, there will be two gods. I said, you are wrong. We don't count gods just like that the way you are. We stick to one God. But this one God revealed in three persons. Now, you cannot deny that. There is the Father, there is the Son, and this is, there is the Holy Spirit. We, call that, we do not call them three gods, but we call them persons of the Godhead. Okay? That's why in the Bible, God, we can call God our Father. Okay? In the Bible, sometimes God called a son. And in the New Testament as well, the Holy Spirit is also divine or God. 
I think after the New Testament, we will discuss that uh, in order for us to fully understand that. And they will try to show their hands. Okay, if God is one, the Father is God, right? And what you are saying? Yes, the, the Son is God. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So two. And the Holy Spirit is God. So how many gods? Three. And that is why they say, we don't believe Trinity because of that. I said, you try to impose your understanding of Trinity on us. Our understanding of Trinity is not what you try to impose on us. Our understanding of Trinity is this. There is one God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is one God. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. There is one tapia. Larry. Who else? Leo and Louis. Yes. Three persons, but one clan. Tapia. One is the church. Yes. Vancouver, Filipino. Burnaby, Filipino. Suri, Filipino. But one Seventh-day Adventist church. One company. But in one company, there are divisions. Right? Say, uh, when you say, uh, one house. Yes, one house. But one house is composed of what? Wall, woods, you name it, floor, that is composed of one house. One car, yes, one car. But one car is one car because there's an engine, there are four wheels, there are windows, there are doors, that is composed of one car. One body, oh yes, there's a head, there's a body, there are hands and feet. Husband and wife, one flesh. There's a husband, there's wife, but it is one. Now, our answer is before I sit down, that this is only an additional. Turn your Bible with me to John, uh, John 17. They love this passage. Okay. Okay, and they will, they will explain like this. Let us ask Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who is the true God? And then let's read verse 3. Okay, and this is eternal light that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. When you read verse 1 and 2, uh, God was talking to the Father. Okay. And then he lift up his eyes to heaven. Verse 1, verse 2, and then verse 3. This is eternal, that they may know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So who is the only true God? They say, the Father. I say, no. There is another statement, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You see? Now, they are one. How come they are one? Verse 11, And I know, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your own name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. One. Another here in verse 21, That they all may be one. How many are, are those one? All talking to those people who will believe and to his disciples. You as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, U.S., us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
and the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one as we are one. How come the, the plural, plural we is one? They are one. You see? Yes, they are one God. But composed of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, I'm a little bit philosophical before until and still is. <laughs> I said, all right. Isa is composed of three letters. I-S-A. Isa. But that three letter is one. Isa. Even in English, one o one e one. It is the same thing. One is composed of three letters o one e. Is it three? Okay. Let's o o n e. <laughs> Let's copy them. O is one letter. Okay. N is one letter. E is one letter. How many? One. O N E. <laughs> it is it is the same thing. In one God, there is in the New Testament the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I think uh, we now understand the background and the survey of Colossians and uh, the let's say message for us is let us put Christ first before anything because, because he is foremost right and he is the center of our faith and hope may God bless us all today Amen. so let's have a closing prayer yes uh, Elder Larry Let's stand and let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for this for the wonderful message that has been given to us, Lord. And as we go home, guide us, Lord, give us the mercy that we need, and please uh, protect us and give us time tomorrow that we come back here and worship you. And please forgive our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, just a quick announcement. Our youth tomorrow will have their first sundown worship here at Vancouver Filipino Church downstairs at 5.30 p.m. We want to encourage all the parents to bring their youth aged 12 to 18 to come and join us uh, for some fun spiritual and social events. Thank you.
Purifier 1000 plus. Purifier 1000 plus. Yang ini. 